here you are, you've taken like a regular steak, which is maybe only 60% um, fat by calorie, and you're eating that as your sole food and you're eating as much as you can, that might work fine for a lot of people. I would say it does work fine for a lot of people. But if you had gotten your diabetes under control with a ketogenic diet, that might be too much protein for you. And I've seen a lot of people come with that situation and say, I went from keto to carnivore and I gained weight and my blood sugar is now going up again. Canola oil is one of the healthiest cooking oils. When the canola seed arrives at the processing factory, it contains foreign material, mostly plant pieces. The seeds pass by a magnet. It removes any metal that may have fallen in during the journey from field to factory. What are you eating right now? Are you eating self-hatred? Well, today we're going to have another fascinating conversation as part of our series on nutrition and health. Uh, we do a series called Seed Oil Survival, uh, but there's more to it than that. It's, you know, it's one thing to figure out what you should avoid, but then it becomes an infinitely complex subject the more you dive into the uh, alternative world of uh, nutrition, uh, where there's various theories and ideologies, as I would call them, uh, dietary ideologies and, you know, all kinds of spin-off schisms within the, every camp, and it becomes almost dizzying for the average person who is not an enthusiast on these subject matters but wants to have effects of healing from the uh, increasingly recognized as flawed dietary guidelines of the United States and, and the world over now. So joining me to talk about uh, something that has become quite uh, a topic of interest within folks who are, I would say, refugees from the standard American diet is Amber O'Hearn. How you doing? Great. Thank you. I'm so glad to have you on. And I've talked up to prominent carnivore advocates, which uh, I guess you would say you are one of those earliest voices in that community. But I've never talked to you, I've never spoken with you yet. So it's going to be interesting to learn your perspective and how it differentiates a little bit from some of the other voices in that community. And, and over the years, I've interviewed a lot of folks from various different, uh, I guess you could say, approaches or philosophies about uh, human diets and nutrition and what's the best way to thrive and, and heal from um, metabolic dysfunction, which is a problem for much of the modern world. And uh, that includes folks like the late Dr. Ray Pete, who was a frequent guest of my program. Georgie Dinkov is kind of a, a, a student of his who I've had on many times. And then I've also had Sean Baker and Paul Saladino and those other, uh, you know, um, Michaela Peterson, a lot of the different voices that have emerged over the years. But everyone has a little bit different angle on this story. And I really wanted to hear what yours is. So I'm glad to have you on. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your background. You, you got into this, your, um, your background's not particularly in nutrition. You're more of a, into, uh, what you say, computer science or what would you describe it as? Yes. My, my academic degrees are in math and computer science. And that was really my driving motivation for a long time. Although I also have studied psychology and linguistics and I'm very interested in cognition I kind of feel like my computer science interest is really an offshoot of my interest in cognition. And when did you start going into a carnivore lifestyle as a way of eating? Kind of kicking and screaming because, yeah. you know, I was brought up vegetarian and okay. I didn't really, you know, what with mainstream ideas, I didn't have any reason to question that until my own health was going sideways. And so <laughs> it was really only when I tried a plant-free diet, and that was after being on a low-carb diet already for a dozen years, uh, and had such drastic improvements in my health that I had to, I really had to revisit everything that I thought that I knew about nutrition in a new light. Well, this is also the week of 4th of July, which I think is traditionally one of the highest carnivorous, you know, consumption 
uh, weeks of the year for Americans. Uh, so everybody's getting out their hot dogs and hamburgers. Um, do you believe that, you know, at the core of your message is a pro, um, you know, pro meat or particularly red meat, uh, you know, part of everybody's lifestyle should include a good a percentage of their caloric intake from red meat and, and fatty red meat sources. Is that what you would say is, is kind of like a standard first step of this conversation? I do think that red meat is really important for humans. Um, it There's so many things that you could do with that. I mean, there's the whole push against red meat. And so you can sort of try to get into all the misinformation about red meat being bad for you. Um, and then there's the fact that humans seem to require some animal source foods in their diet. But it's certainly the case that some small amount of meat has been enough, it seems, for a lot of people to at least live, <laughs> if not be their absolute best optimized self, whatever that means. Um, but the fact that meat in some form or animal sourced food in some form seems to be a requirement is is definitely important, I think. Yeah. Do you, uh, uh, do you believe that the solution to a lot of the problems of metabolic dysfunction is to return to or to shift towards a primarily animal-based diet as you know that's primarily getting much of its nutrients from meat or do you think it's not a one-size-fits-all solution for the problems people face well i think if you had asked me that a few years ago i would have been a little bit more gung-ho about um it working for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I think we we all, when we find the solution to our own problems and then we see it work for a lot of other people, it's very tempting to say that it must work for everyone, especially if there's a lot of good science behind the, the you know, justification for it. Yeah. Um, but I've personally had some health stumbles since I initially started a carnivore diet in 2009. And I've also talked to a lot of people who don't get the same results. And I think earlier in my journey, I would have thought to myself, whether I said it to them or not, that they weren't really doing exactly what they've been advised to do, or they're making either, either being dishonest or making some kind of mistake that we haven't been able to identify. And over the last several years, I've, I've come to realize that that's simply not the case. The same thing doesn't work for everybody. And, and that's because there are complex, different kinds of issues that can be affecting people. I do think, though, that for most people, uh, I would expect them to get good results in terms of weight and mood and autoimmune disorders and digestion. Those are the places where I've seen the most successes on a carnivore diet. Do you think that the carnivore diet should be thought of as, as a primarily as a therapeutic tool rather than a long-term lifestyle for people? Is that the, you know, as a way of like elimination to clear out a lot of the noise and the daily uh, consumptive habits of humans and then get to the core foundation of, of, of uh, nutrition. And then from there, once you've healed your things, try to reintroduce things back into something that works long-term. I think that's well, one of the hardest things because I have done the carnivore <laughs> diet. And one of the hardest things is, is it's extremely, unless you have a really wide you know, variety of social network around you that uh, is eating in the same way, it's very hard socially to maintain that kind of thing, you know, perpetually. It becomes something very difficult. And that is, you know, you know, eating is not just eating. It's that, you know, it's not just a source of nutrition. It's a source of our identity in relationship to our community. So it's a very, very troubling thing if you have something like that, that has such pressure in that area. I agree. I think yeah. the very most difficult part of it is social. I mean, yeah. people might think, and especially I remember when I was first considering the idea, and it took me actually weeks of psyching myself up before I gave it a go, yeah. because the whole idea of restricting my plate that to that degree and I was a big vegetable lover 
Um, it just seemed so daunting. And the only way I was really able to do it was to conceive of it as a very short term intervention. I had set myself up. I was going to do it for three weeks. I was going to stop on my birthday so I could celebrate. And what happened for me personally was that the effects were so drastic. So not only did I start losing weight that had been stubborn, but I also had really strong, already uh, evident within a couple of weeks, mood effects um, that I just felt like on top of the world and I didn't want to stop. And that kept me going for a really, really long time, even in the face of social pressure. I also, I think, so critically, I had support from my husband at the time. Yeah. And uh, secondly, um, I have a kind of personality that can be um, sort of contradictory or in your face. And so <laughs> although I would not say I was flaunting what I was doing, in fact, to the contrary, I actually didn't like to bring it up because I didn't want to have to defend it. But when people did engage me on talking about it, I was like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing it for my health. And that's what I think is right. <laughs> uh, but I but I know that, I mean, the social pressures come from so many directions. There's the social pressure of people who are, you know, the, the concern troll, <laughs> the person who's worried about you and really wants you to do what they think is healthy. Um, that can be hard to surmount especially if they're around you all the time mm -hmm. and then there's the like you said the the role of food in our society is a way that you share with other people a way that you celebrate and very often in families or in friendships there are things that people will cook for you or give you something and they feel like that that it is symbolic of your connection and if you refuse it then that's like a personal rejection so that there are many things that can make it hard that go way beyond like the, the initial cravings that you might have for some variety. Yeah. Um, did, you mentioned uh, that maybe it doesn't work for everyone. What do you think is that underlying that? Is that some people say that, oh, there's these, you got to eat according to your blood type. Other people say, no, you got to <laughs> eat according to your, some kind of genetic thing or, you know, there, or the way your ancestors were on the map of, of uh of the you know earth if they're in the colder climates then they're going to be more adapted to lipolysis and fat burning for fuel and if they're closer to the equator then they're going to be more adapted to thriving on carbohydrate as the primary fuel intake because of the ubiquitous nature of uh you know sugar and fruit available in those regions uh you know, do you have any particular theory or thoughts on some of those ideas about why people thrive differently on different things? I do. And don't let me forget to return to that. But I just realized I forgot to answer uh, another question you asked, which is, um, do I think that it's more of a therapeutic thing that people should do and then try to re reintroduce things? Or if they should, or if it's more like this is the optimal diet. And I think that for people who do thrive on a carnivore diet, um, there are a lot of people who um, would do fine, do great, never reintroducing more plants. That seems to be the case. Um, I was that way for a long time, and I know a lot of people who are. Uh, but I think that if you use that as a tool to figure out um, what might be going wrong ideal here's the ideal scenario the ideal scenario is you start a carnivore diet and a bunch of health problems that you were having uh, maybe even that you didn't know you were having and this happens to a lot of people suddenly resolve and you feel really really great okay so then you have some choices <laughs> you can keep doing it and just say okay i'm good <laughs> or you can start trying to reintroduce things and being in this situation where you have felt um, as good as the carnivore diet is going to make you feel, however good that is, uh, gives you an extraordinarily powerful baseline that you can then use to try to reintroduce things. But the reasons to reintroduce things, I used to think um, that, it, you know, when I first started it, I, I had taken all of the ideas that I had been given about the importance of vegetables at face value. And so I thought, 
well, what am I going to do in the long term? Is this going to be okay? And I thought it might be important to reintroduce them. I don't think that now because I studied a lot and I didn't see uh, a lot of strong evidence that that would be important. But there may there may be other reasons. So maybe there is something for you that um, is important as a health factor. Uh, um, but there's also the whole value of pleasure. <laughs> and I think it can be overlooked. People talk about you know, optimizing their health and pleasure is a component of health. And so if you're going along on a carnivore diet and you feel fantastic physically, but you feel like something's missing, I think that's as legitimate a reason as any other to try to reintroduce things. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that if you're humming along and you don't feel that urge to add more, I don't think there's necessarily a reason to change it if it isn't broke. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now so let's to, yeah the, the the variation what do you think that's based on yeah so because i think that humans uh have this long you know two millennia long history of having meat in their diet and um there there was a point in time the what the way i see it where um uh, we had access to a lot of megafauna and we were able to get all of the nutrients that we needed from a lot of fatty meat, but fatty meat is kind of a critical um, adjective there because you need to have energy. And I really don't think that humans can thrive particularly well on a diet that is uh, really high in protein, not the same as for, for example, um, felines or even canines uh, who can get a much higher percentage of their diet from protein and convert that into energy with less of an issue. Humans have only been carnivorous for a couple million years. And I, I think that, you know, the vestigial evolutionary line that we came from imposes some constraints on that, that uh, a feline wouldn't have. And so if you're only going to get, say, 30 or 40 tops, maybe of your your percent of calories, I don't even like to say it that way because protein really shouldn't be used for calories yeah. in humans. Um, from protein, then you have to get the rest of your calories. You have to get energy from somewhere. And if you're not going to get it from fat, then you're stuck. You have to get it from carbohydrates. And, and I think what happened historically is that um, since we lost megafauna, and a lot of people think that that came from hunting, but mm -hmm. whatever the reason, from that point, um, humans um, diversified in a really magnificent way um, to be able to thrive on many different diets, including diets that are completely uh, very high in carbohydrate and have only a very small amount of animal source food in them. That small amount may be critical, but I think it's quite clear just from looking at people around the world um, in the last few hundred years that um, carbohydrates are not necessarily going to be bad for your health. And um, so I don't think that that means like from a kind of extreme point of view, you could say everyone can thrive on a diet that's all meat, and then some people can thrive by adding more plants to it. Plants uh, tend to have like anti-nutrients and have um, limits on bioavailability of nutrients that some people from some regions have genetically uh, adapted to better to get better, um, you know, better access to nutrients that are locked up in plants. So I think from an extreme point of view, you could say that the people who are going to thrive on uh, diets containing less meat is where the most variation is going to come from. Um, however, I have had to concede over the past few years that some people just don't seem to thrive on a completely plant-free diet. And I, so what I think based on what I know about human history and or um, paleoanthropology type evidence, it seems to me that 
if people are having trouble thriving on an all meat diet, it, it's probably less to do with genetics and more to do with some problem that they've developed um, in their body, for example, some kind of uh, deficiency or toxicity or um, some kind of uh, progressive disease such as diabetes. Uh, that That's actually a common example. I think that some people with a certain amount of diabetic history have a really hard time with very high protein diets. And when you're eating a carnivore diet, unless you're making a, a really big effort to lower the protein and eat a lot of fat in a way that you're simply not going to find by just taking an American plate and removing the plants from it. <laughs> um, people, some people just don't have the metabolic flexibility to do that, and it worsens their diabetes and causes weight gain. So that's the kind of problem. That, they can't handle that much protein, right? It's getting converted into glucose or whatever, or mm -hmm. and they don't have a way to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Is that in a nutshell kind of what's going on there? You think? Or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, so what is a high protein diet in, in what your context of what you're saying? Uh, right. So for for some people who have a pre-diabetic or a diabetic history who come to a carnivore diet. Um, Which is what? That's this. like what, 70, 80% of the country now or what? No, it was 60% have, <laughs> are in a pre-diabetic state, even if they're not overweight, right? I mean, yes, although so I don't know how much time under the diabetic state it takes, or even if that's the right way of thinking of it. But I think certain um, changes happen to your body that are that take a while to undo, regardless. Mm -hmm. um, so, I what I see a lot of people, um, I, what I see happening a lot is people who were diabetic, they went on a ketogenic diet. And it worked fairly well for them. Um, you know, they got their blood sugar under control. They lost some weight. And then maybe they didn't reach all their health goals. Um, they didn't lose as much weight as they wanted to. They, they stalled out or there was more that they thought that they could get. Um, and so that attracted them to the carnivore diet because they maybe have heard a lot of stories um, like mine, where someone was on a low carbohydrate diet and it it got them so far in their health journey and then going to a carnivore diet from there got them even farther. And then they try this and the, the traditional wisdom around the carnivore diet, which is, you know, not wrong for a lot of people is to just eat as much fatty meat as you can even <laughs> like not even, you know, uh, because a lot of people came from a, a sort of maladaptive ca mm. calorie restricted history part of the carnivore diet as i was introduced to it was it that it's really important to eat as <laughs> as much as your body is asking for and not to um sort of give in to ideas in your mind about trying to eat less all the time so it was always encouraged to eat a lot so here you are you've taken like a regular steak which is maybe only um 60 fat by calorie and you're eating that as your sole food and you're eating as much as you can that might work fine for a lot of people i would say it does work fine for a lot of people but if you had gotten your diabetes under control with a ketogenic diet, that might be too much protein for you. And I've seen a lot of people come with that situation and say, I went from keto to carnivore and I gained weight and my blood sugar is now going up again. And so I think it's for those people um, where- Just the increase in their protein consumption from keto to carnivore. Yeah, and I and you asked me concrete numbers, and I'm thinking that the, well, <laughs> I'm going to express it in terms of percent, but that's not very useful sometimes. But say 20%, they went from around 20% of protein to 35 or something like that, and it and it's just too much. Um, of course, the percent is not necessarily very useful because it depends on how much you're eating. Um, and especially if you're trying to eat more than you were before. And I'm actually a big proponent of high energy eating, which I think is 
I think is something I have in common with Ray Pete, although I don't know for sure. What do you mean by um, high energy eating a high calorie, like 3000, 4000, 5000 calories? Mm -hmm. I think it's really important because I think if your body um, starts uh, being fed too little, your whole metabolism adapts down and then that's a really unhealthy state to be in. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think, you know, that's, the, I think that's one of the big problems of, uh, of doing the carnivore diet is that it makes you, you know, at least from my experience, just not hungry, you know? And so you end up eating, you know, maybe an eggs for breakfast with butter, heavy cream with coffee for me. And then you eat a steak and you're full, like you forget to eat and you end up, it's nighttime yeah. and you're coming home from work or whatever. And you're like, I haven't eaten anything since, you know, many, many hours and you know, I'm fine. And I guess I need to eat or, you know, if you expend too much energy, then you can, you know, that's one of the problems that I, I think happens actually with carnivore is that like, if you go for me, you know, like going, you just have no hunger. And then all of a sudden, if you push that a little bit too far, you get into the zone where you're like really hungry, which makes you, your body want carbs or something quick to get that energy back. You know? Yeah. I would say that the mm. number one pitfall on carnivore and to a lesser extent keto is to under eat. Yeah. And it's sometimes I think it happens quite naturally, like yeah. the way you describe, like you just, you just kind of forget. Um, but, and, and then that can sort of <laughs> gradually build on itself until you realize you've been under eating over and over. Um, and that can contribute to the stress cascade, right? That people, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, accuse you know the keto carnivore world of having which we can get into in a little bit but exactly. but just that low caloric intake alone can can cause a lot of that stress cascade effect taking place right if you do that chronically yes. for month after month which you know just from an economics not to cut you off but just a, from an economic standpoint when you're when you're when you're kind of going in this oh i can have a ribeye a day thing you know, you can't have three or four ribeyes a day unless you're a, a wealthy <laughs> podcaster. You know what I mean? So, right. <laughs> you know, with the sponsorships to make sure those those nice, fancy buffalo, you know, grass-fed, you know, uh, mountain water uh, drinking, you know, uh, $80 a pound, you know, bison steaks are delivered, you know, fresh on ice every morning because of a sponsorship deal. You, the average working class person doesn't have that kind of resource. So that's one of the... I would say you pragmatic utilities of people having success with carnivore is that, you know, even though it can be expensive to eat these expensive cuts of meat, they do satiate you. And then, so you can kind of coast on a low caloric intake every day, you know, because of that. Right. right. That, and that, then that, there's that does create a common problem there. Right. I agree. And in addition to that, I think that there are a lot of people who are so desperate to lose weight and to be as thin as they can yeah. that they will sort of abuse the appetite suppressant properties of ketogenic and carnivore diets to deliberately eat less yeah. and and this i think also is a really common problem maybe more so for women than for men yeah. um even though i think that it's overstated that men i i i can i think it we should acknowledge that men have a lot of pressure on how they look, but regardless, I do see a lot of people um, going on a ketogenic diet or reports of people on keto or carnivore who are women who really push the boundaries of how little they can eat because they're so desperate yeah. to be thin. Yeah. And then in women, you will see, you know, men will see hormonal problems too, but in women, it becomes yeah. very, <laughs> very obvious when you yeah. stop ovulating uh, or stop menstruating yeah. um, that something has gone wrong. And then, as you alluded to before, then people say, "Oh, it's the it's keto," and they'll start eating carbs again. Their period will come back, and they'll say, "Ketogenic diets don't work for me. Women need carbs." And I would counter that with women need food, <laughs> women need energy, people yeah. need energy. Yeah. Um, so you share that common thought with Ray Pete that, you know, because he was telling me, you know, in a, a kind of a notorious clip 
uh, for folks that saw it online with Brad Marshall and I, he was saying he was eating 9,000 calories a day in the 1950s as a, as a worker for the forest in the forest department. Brad was, uh, or Ray was Ray in the 1950s. He was uh, working for the department of forestry (laughs) doing mild walking and eating 9,000 calories a day. Now he's not saying that people need to eat 9,000. I mean, I said, what do you say? Like 5,000 a day. He's like, yes, if you're, metabolism is good. You should be, and that's probably where you probably need to be. And, uh, um, uh, you know, he said he would have, you know, back then, you know, they would have this cook who worked for the military before he joined their, uh, unit and he would cook just loads of, uh, hot cereals and, you know, stacks of pancakes and pork chops and beef and loads of butter. And they have these little uh, bags of their food meal bags that they would carry with them while they're out in the forest doing walking and planting of trees, not really high exercise, you know, not really heavy lifting, not really any intense cardio. And he was saying he was taking out 9,000 calories a day. So, you know, something I think you would probably then agree because Brad Marshall has showed in the 1930s, the USDA showed the average person was consuming, was it three or 4,000 calories a day? And that's all human beings, not just like an adult man. So they, uh, do you believe, believe do you believe that that's indicative that something environmentally is poisoning and destroying our metabolism? And therefore now we're at what? 2000 calories a, a day on average. And we're actually in some evidence suggests that we have more daily caloric output expenditure uh, uh, than they did back then in the early half of the 20th century. And yet we're having these heavy uh, percentages of obesity and, and chronic disease. So is something environmentally taking place there that you think is pinpointed with your research? Certainly could be. Uh, I, I think it's interesting that the, you know, the food labels all say to, based on a 2000 calorie a day average and, yeah. I don't know the history of where that 2000 calories came from, Mm -hmm. but I can remember when I first started a carnivore diet, um, I'm not a big calorie counter and I hate weighing and measuring my food, but I really wanted to know. So for about three months, uh, a few months into dieting, I started measuring everything and I was still like actively losing weight and I was eating somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 calories a day yeah. and I'm a five, six woman. So yeah. the idea that a man could survive and be, you know, really virile and healthy on 2,000 calories a day just seems preposterous to me. Isn't um, that, but isn't that, it's something's chilling when you think about a human population eating 2,000 calories a day with massive levels of obesity and all these chronic diseases. It's like if you, I mean, not, I'm not making a point here other than to say, as an example, it's like some kind of, you know, if you wanted to malevolently harm a species and literally draw down their energy ability such that they're eating a half of energy as the, their ancestors just a few generations ago, and yet they are starved, malnourished, obese, and in chronic pain. My God, you couldn't think of a more diabolical situation, really. I mean, you yeah. know, to be literally starving people while they can't get up off the couch. I mean, it's just, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing that feels better than being being full of energy. I mean, that's what yeah. it, feeling full of life is yeah. feeling full of energy, yeah. and. And I'm not trying to avoid answering your question. I yeah. do think that the evidence that high levels of linoleic acid could be doing that are yeah. pretty compelling. I've been yeah. a fan of Peter Dobromilsky for yeah. many, many years. Yeah, and hyperlipid, yeah. Yeah, had, yeah. Did you, ever, did you see that panel I did? It was called the My Big Fat Panel, where I no. had Tucker Goodrich and Kate Shanahan Brad Marshall, Peter Dobromilski, and Ray P. all giving their theories as to why seed oils have been linked to this rise in obesity. And each one had a different mechanism. And I yes. said, now, guys, if you got to get it together, because I said, if you guys were going to be the all-star team to present your case to academia, you'd have to figure out how to get all of your 
all of your different mechanisms in alignment here so that you would make a you know, at least a comprehensive case or a focused case on what is actually going on here. But that was that's, a fascinating discussion. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I shall have to put that on yeah. my list. You know, um, I ran a carnivore conference uh, in 2019 in yeah. Boulder, and I had gotten another one on the books for 2020. And of course, all mm. that completely fell apart. And I haven't had the bandwidth to put it back together and do another one. But on the 2020 docket, which never happened, um, I had a I had Peter and Brad and uh, Michael Eads were going to do a panel on that oh, yeah. that topic. Um, but not one. yeah, but you had even more different opinions and different ideas of why that might be happening. Yeah, very interesting. Do you, um, so do you do you reside in Colorado, by the way? I do. Do, do you yeah. I'm see that's one of the things I've been researching a lot more lately is uh, Ray Pete's work on altitude and you know uh, carbon dioxide production as a as a key component to solving metabolic dysfunction. Have you looked into that and do you have any anecdotal evidence perhaps maybe that it's helped you with some um, I don't know if it's helped oh. me. I know that when I go down to sea level it feels amazing. I was born in like sea level better. He's well, saying, well, what oh. I mean is oh. like from living here, it gives oh. me that advantage when I go to sea level. I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I I'm from Nova Scotia and so I visit there fairly often and yeah, I feel like uh, I definitely have really pumped up um, blood oxygenation uh, ability yeah. because yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, he says that, you know, the higher in altitude you go, you get more and more because of the lower oxygen pressure, more and more ability for your body to produce its own carbon dioxide, which kind of paradoxically helps oxygenate the tissues more effectively around your body, which allows for uh, the reduction of lactic acid to be built up, which allows for uh, kind of, you know, preventing a lot of these disease states of the metabolism, like obesity and cancer. And I just did a basic little research. I said, I searched online, what is the least obese state? And it was Colorado. And I said, oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting. And I looked, well, what's the, what's the uh, highest average lifespan of any county in the United States? And it was the highest altitude counties in Colorado. And I said, well, there you go. That's something interesting to think about. Obviously, there's more factors that need to be explored there. there apparently, Russia did a lot of research on this topic. And um, I think that, uh, you know, I also looked up, you know, which I knew already, the highest uh, average lifespan of any nation in the world is Andorra, which is a, a kingdom in the Pyrenees Mountains between uh, Spain and France. So, you know, I don't know if that has any bearing uh, to what degree carbon dioxide uh, production in the body relates to, um, you know, solving this metabolic dysfunction so many people are trying to solve. But I just wanted to get your take on it there. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, Definitely, you could come up with other hypotheses. I know that Boulder draws fit people here, and because of the great opportunity to do outdoor sports yeah. activities, but I think there is probably more to it than that. Yeah. I would suspect the causality is in the other direction. And yeah. then I have looked a little into the um, ideas around using breath work to accomplish the same kind of thing like yeah. doing exercise making sure that your mouth is closed when you're doing yeah. aerobic exercise for example to um, increase carbon dioxide in the blood for all those reasons um, yeah. i'm not an expert on it but it does seem yeah. pretty interesting so your website www.mostly-fat.com are kind of gives the same thing you're suggesting which is that you think for yourself, at least, the most optimal form of carnivore diet is a high fat intake diet rather than a high protein, right? So, well, and, it's and funny. I, I would just make a caveat on that. I think that even a high protein carnivore diet is still going to be a high fat <laughs> carnivore yeah. diet. It's still going to be mostly fat, at least from a calorie perspective. Yeah. Like, well, you could eat like lean chicken breasts and stuff, right? And and like you could, but nobody survives carnivore doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, even without supplementation or anything like that. I mean, to cheat because it's all. I think yeah. pretty quickly people have symptoms, and yeah. if they're following the you know the advice to eat what you feel like eating as long as it's carnivore friendly, they're yeah. they're going to very quickly be driven toward fattier cuts and red meat. 
um, even if they intended to start with with lean and if they force themselves to stay lean for example if they don't like red meat or have um, some other reason that they're not going to eat it that it tends to just result in attrition attrition from the diet they mm -hmm. won't stick with it they i mean they might start losing their hair or something <laughs> like it's yeah. not good <laughs> So as, so what is your, uh, you know, what do you usually use for your fat oriented approach to the carnivore approach? Um, I mostly will just eat red meat like lamb chops or, um, really fatty ground beef. If it's starting to be too lean, I will sometimes add butter or tallow. Um, I think, I think it's usually best to go with your gut because I think that um, appetite changes and that it's telling you something like some, yeah. some days you might just feel like eating leaner. And I think that that's not a problem to do. And uh, you avoid allowing... coconut oil or is there a reason that you do if you do? I have tried yeah. coconut oil various times um, over the years. And um, at first I found that it was, I used to have rosacea, the kind with, um, there are different types, but just the kind that makes your face all red and flushed all the time. And that was one of the things that the carnivore diet seemed to really put into remission, yeah. um, which I wasn't expecting. There are so many things that I wasn't expecting to have anything to do with diet. Um, mm. And that was one of them. But I noticed that if I would put coconut oil in my coffee it would cause a uh, rosacea flare and so mm. I didn't do it for a long time and then more recently I thought it might be okay um well I tried it and I didn't seem to have as much reaction as I did mm. before and I thought well this is probably a good source of fat because at least it's mm. saturated you know um <laughs> and tried introducing a lot more but I didn't mm. it it didn't give me any extra benefits. So I laid back on it again. Yeah. So uh, you're not like, when you say mostly fat, you're not eating like literally chunks of like suet and stuff as your primary fuel source without meat. You're eating normal kind of. So I have done that. Okay. And um, yeah, that's why I wanted to interrupt you a little bit about yeah. that. Um, because when I say mostly fat, when I named the website that, I wasn't thinking of really high fat, low protein variations of carnivore diets. I was just thinking about like the plain old carnivore diet, even with fairly high protein levels is still, you know, if you go gram for gram, it's still at most probably one gram of protein per gram of fat. And I don't think that people do very well if they go lower than that. Um, but then in the in the past few years, um, because of um, really deciding to listen to people who are having trouble with the standard sort of traditional carnivore diet, um, and because of the influence of Paleo Medicina, the Hungarian group who are treating people with um, all meat diets, um, but highly ketogenic ones. I started uh, researching and playing around with and talking to people about doing what <laughs> I accidentally dubbed as keto AF, which is supposed to mean ketogenic animal foods. And I was just making a, like a joke, but the term kind of took off. So this keto AF approach um, is where people are really limiting their protein to like maybe 1.4 grams per kilogram of ideal weight and some people even lower um, and then filling the rest of their caloric needs with fat but only fat from carnivore sources you're really left with having to eat suet or tallow on a spoon or something of that nature because you you can't go into the like olive oil on salad type of thing um to about get people your fat that are doing from. like heavy cream and stuff, they're just eating lots of that. So I I do definitely know some people that that works really well for. Yeah. I also know a lot of people who just don't seem to be able to tolerate that much dairy in their diet for whatever yeah. reason. Even at the uh, cream level, it seems like most people yeah. who have problems with dairy, once you get to the heavy cream level, you've eliminated a lot of the proteins and the 
lactose yeah. that hits people and whatever else and you you're basically we're tolerating that but even people can't tolerate that huh? what, i wonder what it is about that yeah i don't know um there could be some kind of insulogenic factor it could be vitamin a um it's, it's hard to say yeah do you, are you an advocate of organ meat like liver and regular consumption of things like liver, not oysters, really or eating um, oysters for your vitamins I think oysters are delicious, and I even am. I'm one of those people who actually likes the taste of liver, yeah. and will will eat it on occasion. But I also um, early on noticed that there was a sort of anti correlation between success on a carnivore diet and eating a lot of organs, especially eating them with a view to trying to meet RDAs. Um, a lot of people just felt worse eating a lot of organ meat and is it because um, of how unpleasant some of them can be, or is it just even people who like on? them? Yeah. So, um, I started, you know, several years ago thinking that maybe, um, something about the carnivore diet lowers the threshold for vitamin A toxicity. And then, of course, you know, that the idea of vitamin A toxicity has absolutely exploded over the yeah. past few years, um, thanks to uh, Grant Jenner's work, and then many people who have yeah. um, come in and, and built more on top of that. Um, I think um, it's one of the more interesting hypotheses about why the carnivore diet is so successful for some people um, because it unless you're adding a lot of liver which until until recently like maybe with Paul Saladino people didn't do that the the carnivore wisdom from the olden days uh, including from Ousley Stanley, the bear, who was uh, a model, and even from Vilmer Stephenson, was that uh, maybe a bit of organs is okay, but eating a lot of liver was discouraged. Um, so, so one of the more interesting hypotheses that came around was that the reason that a carnivore diet is so beneficial is because it's a, it's a vitamin A elimination diet, unless mm -hmm. you're doing that liver thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, <laughs> the lower seed oil hypothesis also would fit with that. Most carnivores, even if you're eating, even if you're eating like half of your food from pork, I think that the other half being not pork and the top mm -hmm. maximum amount that pork could be giving you of linoleic acid it's still much lower than you would be getting if you're yeah. doing keto with mm -hmm. a whole bunch of salads and it's covered in canola oil ray pete has cited a study where they fed rodents a essential fatty acid deficient diet and they you know reported doing all kinds of horrible toxic things these poor things and grabbing them by the tail and slamming them up against furniture and no pains were, were seemingly able to be uh, scientifically seen. Like they had reduced a lot of the, you know, markers of inflammation by, you know, getting rid of these so-called essential fatty acids almost completely out of their yeah. diet. Uh, do you share a similar thought that perhaps much of inflammation is driven by these omega threes and omega sixes? Um, you know, in the in the diet, not necessarily yeah. straight out like that because, um, well, arachidonic acid is an omega six fatty acid, and it's highly associated with inflammation because you can use arachidonic acid to increase, like, to make yeah. pro inflammatory um, cytokines, I guess, yeah. um, and so some people think, oh, well, just the fact of having arachidonic acid there is going to increase your inflammation but i don't think that's the case i think yeah. that there has to be a call for inflammation first before your body's going to make that into yeah. inf inflammation and um 
another reason why I'm skeptical about um, just the sort of <laughs> it's there and therefore there's inflammation is because on a ketogenic diet, uh, levels of arachidonic acid and um, other like highly unsaturated fatty acids, uh, so DHA basically and um, arachidonic acid will go up in the bloodstream. And that's even um, some people have hypothesized that that is part of or one of the main reasons that a ketogenic diet is good for epilepsy. There are many, many such ideas, but that's just one of them, um, and maybe not my favorite one. But the fact remains that those that those levels go up, yeah. and it's not associated with excess inflammation. So I think yeah. that a it depends on what kind of polyunsaturated fatty acid, but also on what what the body's doing with it. One of the biggest uh, objections I've heard from the bioenergetic camp is that basically there's the narrative is is that when you're young, your thyroid if you're healthy, your thyroid is is vibrant, it's strong, and that's why children are drawn naturally to sugary foods and they've got boundless energy and a kind of gregarious uh, personality, and that because of environmental toxins, primarily, uh, excess PUFA, which children usually get hit with a lot of that very early on, chicken nuggets and, you know, toxic candies and all kinds of garbage foods, red dyes and, you know, the usual suspects that people in the health world are are, are, are starting to discover as problematic, pesticides and EMF, all these different things. But primarily the PUFA seems to be the biggest uh, elephant in the room that all of these things contribute to basically creating an impaired thyroid where you start to lean more and more increasingly on your backup energy, uh, you know, uh, energy system, which includes, you know, the use of the adrenaline, the use of cortisol, uh, which, you know, is associated with an increase in serotonin. So basically there's a kind of dualistic and, you know, it's, I'm not giving it a perfect picture here, but a kind of dualistic picture you have, right. Which is like, you can be in a high thyroid state where you've got a lot of T3 and it's a, it's not, not a lot of reverse thyroid going on and you are you can have those high calories and you're eating sugars and milks and orange juice and you're living in the Garden of Eden of youth and then society with its authoritarian imposition of grains and seed oils shuts that down for whatever reason, right? Just environmentally. And then people have to thrive on basically uh, you know, fatty acid oxidation, the use of, of, of fat as fuel. Uh, and so to the extent that I'm just kind of building their narrative from, and trying to be fair to both sides to the extent that keto and carnivore subsequently remove those PUFA and other, you know, additives from processed food. And to the extent that they cleanly lean into the fat as fuel paradigm that the system is pushing people into, uh, it, it produces good results because in comparison to everybody else still running French fries and Doritos and everything else, pizza, that's going to create a much cleaner environment for the metabolism to thrive. But I think what the Ray P and bioenergetic paradigm is saying is that, well, but that's still leaning into the problem rather than, you know, it's like you, your car's in, in a mud pit. You can go, you can back it up and try to get the thyroid back, or you can go lean into it and kind of somehow use the fattest fuel paradigm in the cleanest way possible, which seems to be the keto approach. First right, of all, does right. that sound fair to kind of the way they describe it? And, you know, so they're saying that, you know, the problem with the keto thing long term is that you're putting too much stress on the body. You're, you're creating elevated cortisol and, you know, suppression of thyroid function, which is going to, at the end, accelerate the aging and the kind of decay part of, uh, of, of the lifespan at a rate that is not really conducive. So, yeah, I think that is what they say. And I think there's some correct parts in it and there's something mm. that I would like to try to contribute a different idea to. Sure. Um, so, I do absolutely think that if you are primarily eating carbohydrates um, and your thyroid is not responding and your your body sort of then turning toward using more fat as fuel, uh, that's indicative of a problem. I mean, that's kind of what diabetes is. <laughs> um, you know, 
if you're eating high carbohydrates and yet you have a whole lot of free fatty acids in your systems or, or goodness forbid you're generating ketones while on a high carb diet, that's definitely a problem. Um, but the thyroid T3 basically should match the amount of carbohydrates your body is using uh, like systemically. So if you're using less carbohydrate and your T3 goes down, that that's a normal response and it's not it's not indicative of a problem with your thyroid. It's not a problem not to be using thyroid if you're relying on more fat. Um, I do think what you said about um, leaning into it is correct in the sense that if you have diabetes, say, and or, or some other problem with glucose metabolism. Maybe it's not frank diabetes, but you address this by switching over to a fat-based metabolism, then you have definitely avoided the problem. And I don't necessarily think there's any problem with staying in a fat-based metabolism, which is a place where I would differ from that narrative that you described. I think staying in a fat-based metabolism can be perfectly healthy, but it doesn't necessarily correct the problem. And if you can't readapt to a high glucose diet, um, and it may take a few days, like you wouldn't expect to go from a very low carb, high fat diet and go to eating sugar and the next day your sugars are gonna go up. And I'm not talking about that. But if you can't readapt to eating high glucose and not have a diabetic response or whatever the response is, you haven't fixed anything. You have you have merely avoided the problem and it's a Band-Aid solution. Right. So is there a reason why you don't integrate carbohydrates like milk and orange juice and these things that Ray Pete uses as tools to, to keep your metabolism healthy? Um, the For me, it immediately causes rapid weight gain. So mm -hmm. that indicates to me that there is still something wrong with me that hasn't been fixed. <laughs> I see. So you're, but I so... don't think there's anything wrong with it in principle. In principle, I think that people should be able to thrive on a high carb diet. Lots of people do. Yeah. And, and if you're not, that yeah. there's something wrong. Yeah. So you're suggesting that, are you, are you suggesting that you think staying in this high fat carnivore diet is going to, at some point, correct the underlying problem of the metabolism such that theoretically down the road, if it's corrected by this therapy, would then allow you to reintroduce carbohydrates and not have rapid weight gain? Is that, that is, is that that's the goal. And I think that it is possible because I know that I, I have started hearing reports of people who are on long-term ketogenic diets that, um, have been able to reintroduce carbohydrates and not get the same uh, diabetic response um, that they did in the past. But I've only heard a few such anecdotes. And I think that that might be because there's uh, you can do ketogenic diets, obviously, in vastly different ways. Like you can do a vegetarian ketogenic mm -hmm. diet. You can do a carnivore ketogenic diet. You can diet. do a seed oil heavy ketogenic diet, which probably most exactly. people do, unfortunately. <laughs> right. So if if we simplify things to like one simple hypothesis and say, OK, it was the linoleic acid that's causing the problems and it's being incorporated into tissues and causing these uh, glucose um, intolerance, then it. Like going on a ketogenic diet, if you're doing it in a way that still includes all those oils, you're never going to get out of there. Yeah. So um, what do you, in yeah. your model of this ketogenic diet, what are you proposing as the mechanism that will kick in or to, to, to solve this metabolic pro the problem so that you can return to a carbohydrate diet with or integrate it back in without having the the weight gain what do you what is the proposed mechanism you see i honestly don't know i'm very open to the idea that it is a linoleic Pufa, acid like problem Pufa depletion like you're just you're mm -hmm. basically you're you're basically mining the the body fat till you've eliminated a certain threshold of PUFA. Is that the idea? Or is the that could the be. Brad Marshall yeah. goes with the monounsaturated fat is almost just as problematic, right? So that's a whole yeah. other can of worm, right? And then he goes into the, you know, the, the, um, 
the uh, SCD1 factor. Do you find anything there that is appealing to you in that? Um, well, so Brad right now, I think is, has been doing a very low fat, high carbohydrate yeah. diet and seeing some success on that. Um, and that also could be a way to deplete, um, linoleic acid yeah. from the yeah. body. Um, yeah. I, I once did some research that indicated to me that, it might actually be best like the the fastest if you alternated between a ketogenic diet and a very high carb low fat diet and what kind of intervals um <laughs> yeah there there's the rub right but um so one man's yo yo dieting is another man's therapy it's amazing <laughs> right <laughs> the the main piece of evidence that that persuaded me is that if you take uh I think it was rats and might've been mice um, and you fast them yeah. um, so that they're obviously highly ketogenic and mm -hmm. then give them a fat free, high carb diet. Uh, obviously they will start having to upregulate lipogenesis really strongly because they were relying on fat for metabolism and suddenly there's none being brought in yeah. and the benefit of that even though so lipogenesis seems like the, exactly the wrong thing that you would not want but when you upregulate all those genes <laughs> including a cd1 um you're you're gonna actually convert linoleic yeah. acid up to arachidonic acid yeah. and it might be healthier to have it in that form hmm. yeah. and then but then that boost is only going to come during the adaptation so yeah. If I were going to design a protocol around it, um, not knowing, <laughs> like no guarantee that this would work, yeah. I would probably alternate every week or something like that. Yeah. I've heard some suggest, which I've often wondered myself, and I find myself kind of shifting in that way uh, naturally, which is, you know, eating kind of a ketogenic diet in the winter and then eating more sugars during the spring and summer, which makes sense, you know kind of like right. probably what a lot of folks would have done if they, unless they were in a environment, you know, where there was fruit and so forth abundant around year round, you know, it's, it's, I always think it's interesting to look at these molecules, like a kind of environmental signal telling you where you're at in relationship to the sun and the environment, you know, like I think about the origin of cattle, which is highly saturated fat, you know, and they, India, right. is near the equator, right. This tropical environment. You have, um, you have, you know, coconut oil from the, it's, it's highly saturated. You've got, you know, she butter and all these highly saturated fats are typically, you know, cocoa, you know, cocoa butter. This is all near these warm climates. And that's also, you know, where you're going to see a lot of fruit. And it's almost like, and that's what Ray Pete is saying is that, you know, it's that high saturated fat with the fruit that he likes, you know, as the sweet spot, which is this, but and then you've got folks, you know, with the seed oils, those are in cold water fish or, or you know, the PUFA or the mm -hmm. PUFA is found in these cold uh, climate plants, right? Which is going to signal to your body there's not enough sun, not enough food, you know, not enough fruit on the tree, not enough animals running around. You need to go ahead and start storing on fat because winter's coming. But uh, winter's not always coming, but yet everybody's bodies are acting like that when they eat the level of, of PUFA and grains that is this perfect deadly combination, apparently, you know, especially yeah. when fried together, right? I mean, goodness. As a counterpoint, if you, if you lean into that, though, and if you um, go completely over to a fat-based metabolism, um, PUFA is going to get preferentially burned. You can probably... Um, I, I haven't seen any um, evidence in the literature of this. I don't think it's been tested, but it seems to me that the level of polyunsaturated fat that you could um, tolerate uh, without it ca causing a health problem is much higher on a ketogenic diet because you're burning all that fat um, and you I don't have I, carbohydrates I, to, because like, yeah. one of the problems, yeah. at least in um, yeah. in Peter W. Milsky's, uh conception of with the problem is that 
polyunsaturated fatty acids make carbohydrate metabolism unsatiating. So if you don't have the carbohydrates, you're just burning the polyunsaturated fats right off. It's going to cause higher mitochondrial uncoupling. It's more associated with like brown adipose tissue. Um, it, it could the be burning actually. Of PUFA? Yeah. Wow. So that's, that's interesting because then from the other side, they're saying the burning of PUFA is one of the most problematic things. It creates all this, you know, I mean, have you looked at that, the negative effects of the burning of PUFA too? Or, you know, is there pros and cons with it from what you've seen? Or is it pr primarily a positive effect? The lipolysis I think of this. If you're burning PUFA and you're eating carbohydrates, uh, I think there is evidence that it's going to make carbohydrates less satiating. It's going to increase insulin sensitivity, bringing more carbohydrates in and um, into fat tissue yeah. for storage. But if you're not eating any carbohydrates, then you don't get that consequence of it. Mm -hmm. And the only negative consequence that I can see that might happen if you're in the ketogenic situation for meeting a very high PUFA diet is tissue incorporation. Um, which then could have, you know, consequences on how well the, you know, phospholipids are working to do whatever they're supposed to do, yeah. um, cardiolipin and, and, um, and maybe certain kinds of damage to tissue that yeah. could be happening from there. Okay. That's very interesting. And I think, do you think that children should be eating ketogenically or do you think that they would thrive better with, you know, and it's better for their, and all things being equal to be eating more of a carbohydrate based? Uh... I think as long as they're getting adequate protein and adequate energy, it shouldn't really matter. Yeah. I mean, yeah. throughout the uh, time when they're, before they have solid food introduced, they're going to be in, in ketosis a lot. Yeah. Um, you you can hardly stop it, yeah. so I I don't think it's it's going to be bad. Yeah, I guess what I'm, your conception of carnivore and ketogenic interventions are primarily intended for those who have already been metabolically impaired by the the current standard system. Would you say is that right? It's not because some people are saying no. You should you should raise all generations. You know should be primarily eating you know beef, butter, and bacon as their fuel, and and you should be you know chiding them for eating excess sugar. I mean, even folks who are have nothing to do with the ketogenic paradigm don't want children eating sugar. But, you know, would you say that those are wrong-headed assumptions in general? Um I think that a lot of people would probably thrive and do excellently on a ketogenic or a carnivore diet even if they don't have metabolic problems. Uh, for example, I've heard of people who are athletes who are thriving on ketogenic diets because it it improves their ability to do endurance sports. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I have also talked to people who didn't seem to be necessarily in a bad way metabolically and tried carn a carnivore diet for other reasons, for example, digestive, and, and they just they feel fine. Um, so I don't think that it's something to be avoided just because there's nothing wrong with you. And another thing that I think is quite interesting is all of the surprise benefits that I've heard of people having over the years. I mean, even just you think about what a carnivore diet is known for now, things mm. like um, reprieve from um autoimmune diseases or for mood disorders, none of that was expected. Like when, when we started doing that, we thought it was going to be beneficial for weight loss primarily. That's what most people came to yeah. it for. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people that I talked to over in the early years, especially who started a carnivore diet for whatever vanity reason um, would say, oh, you know, like I used to have trouble swallowing and I don't anymore, or I used to get Raynaud's in my feet during the winter and I don't anymore, or um, this skin problem that I have went away. And so I think it's possible that a lot of people who aren't really sick or don't think of themselves as thick could, could get benefits. Um, but on the other hand, I acknowledge that we don't really know what the mechanism is yeah. and a carnivore diet might 
is, you know, it's likely to be overkill in certain cases, because if it really is just about vitamin A depletion, or if it really is just about um, PUFA depletion, then obviously you don't need to eat zero plants to get those same benefits. Yeah. Or the benefits of ketones, right? There's a lot of things there, right? And you can right. get ketones through, you know, food rather than making it yourself. So that could be another, you know, variable that needs to be worked out, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, this, so that's I think... where the, yeah, that's one of the things that I that I was I didn't even understand that, you know, that, that you get ketones from fruit and other things. And I thought, you know, because Ray Pete was telling me, you know, that you don't want to burn, you don't want to make your own ketones. That's a very stressful process. You want to, if, if you're going to get ketones and benefit from them, eat them, you know. So and I thought, okay, well, maybe that's a way to get your cake and eat it too, so to speak, right? To be able to. I don't know about getting yeah. ketones from fruit. Uh, yeah. I've never heard that. Um, and I'm wondering if from, he means from, if he means chemical ket ketones is such a bad yeah, word from, because yeah because keto the, when we say ketogenesis or ketosis yeah. we're talking about three specific chemicals and we call them ketones for short but they're not right. ketones I think two of them are ketones and one of them's not no. and then there are many other compounds that are ketones that are not one of these yeah. three ketone bodies yeah. Um, I think he describes them as being in some fruit and, you know, then things like MCT oil or whatever, I guess. You get it. Right. MCT oil will cause your liver yeah. to generate ketones. Yeah. 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 Um, as the point about making things being stressful, that's something I really want to push back on a little bit because, you know, so one of the things that I've heard a lot of people say is stressful is gluconeogenesis, making mm. uh, making your own sugar. And I mean, it definitely it, it's a process that takes energy and it takes, you know, your body has to do it. Yeah. But almost every mammal uses, gets almost all of their glucose from gluconeogenesis. Um, so carnivorous animals do it from protein. And herbivores do it by, um, they eat fiber and the fiber is broken down by bacteria in the gut. And that results in um, three different kinds or at least three different kinds of short chain fatty acids. And then those short chain fatty acids, um, particularly uh, propionate, I think, is used for GNG, for gluconeogenesis mm -hmm. to give them sugar. Um, Almost no animals, except for maybe some very pure frugivores, are getting the like sugar requirements that they need from the diet. Almost every animal is making it that way. So I consider it sort of a default metabolic process that it's very unusual for humans not to be doing that. And so to think of that as stressful, I think, is a bit of a stretch. What about the claims that it, that you know ketogenic uh, fat burning for fuel is going to be associated with high levels of cortisol or some of these other you know yeah anecdotally people I've encountered have said they feel more likely to have kind of aggressive feelings sometimes when they're on a <laughs> ketogenic or carnivore diet I don't know don't what say that, that. <laughs> yeah yeah that, so you know um, <laughs> that, that you know they're not as gregarious as they are when they're eating a bowl of honey so um you know do you i mean is there anything to some of these things that there's an association with the uh, elevated stress hormones and uh you know i think i think there's at least two wrong reasons people believe that one is that um there's a sort of reverse logic that's implied so we know that if cortisol goes up um one of its functions is to create the release of sugar in, in a so it it stimulates gluconeogenesis and that's used in the fight or flight response. And so people say, oh, cortisol is used to generate sugar. That means if you're generating sugar, then your cortisol had to go up to do that. But mm -hmm. that's not actually how it normally happens in the context of a, a ketogenic diet. What happens is your blood sugar starts to go down and glucagon goes up. So it's it's it doesn't rely on cortisol at all in that way. Your, your blood sugar would have to drop into the like fifties or below um, for cortisol to start coming into play for that. Yeah. Um, and then the other one is 
that in some cases, in some measurements, the amount of cortisol that's going around in your blood is mildly elevated on a ketogenic diet. Um, that's a real thing. And it seems to come from not higher production of it. So it's not like a stress response and your body says we need to produce more cortisol, but actually um, more efficient regeneration and less yeah. um, less loss of it in the urine. Yeah. Um, so you might say, well, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? And it's hard to know, um, except that I would call attention to um, longevity studies in dietary restriction of non-human animals in mm -hmm. which it has been found repeatedly that there is also in that situation a mild um, elevation of cortisol levels. And what all the researchers who are faced with that observation in animals that actually lived longer and had mildly elevated cortisol, like they can't say anything except either, <laughs> either it contributed to the longevity or the longevity happened in spite of it. Um, mm -hmm. But they tend to say, oh, well, you know, cortisol has all these anti-inflammatory properties. So maybe it's actually contributing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about feeling aggressive. Mm -hmm. There's definitely mm -hmm. a, um, like a stereotype of ketosis causing um, a, a sort of calm mental clarity. And I think a lot of people get that, but I don't know if yeah. people are more aggressive or not. <laughs> Why do you think that there's been, you know, some high profile folks who have abandoned the carnivore space? You know, I know, you know I don't want to get into mind reading what their motives are, but what do you <laughs> think in general of that trend where you have folks like, you know, you have Paul Saladino who, you know, he really, you know, got put on the map because of advocating for a carnivore that's got on Rogan's show and really took off with that. And then you have, you know, even folks like, uh, uh, Dr. Joseph Mercola, right. Who's a long-term, a long time, you know, ketogenic, you know, advocate for many years. And now he's kind of moving into, well, Paul, Paul Saladino is moving into taking a lot of uh, Ray Pete's insights and incorporating them into what he advocates. And so is Mercola and, uh, the, Another one I think of is the the strong sisters who've been advocates of the animal. They were on that show, The Doctors, with Paul in that notorious interview where they were treating him like he was this. I mean, that was pretty vicious, you know. The way they, they trotted him out there and treated him like he was this horrible person. And they brought the girls out and said, "Look, you're convincing these girls to do this horrible extreme diet." I thought it was a total obvious, you know, you know, corporate media hit job. But why do you think so many of these folks are, you know? moving away and and why is it that you know it seems like some people eat carbs all their lives and then they find all their health benefits going to keto carnivore and then other folks do keto carnivore for so long uh you know and then they hit a wall uh two of i mean two of uh i guess uh ray pete's biggest advocates danny roddy and georgie dinkoff both report being carnivores before or keto guys versus i think one was carnivore one was keto before they just wrecked their body and now they're flourishing so why do you think you see this i mean i know there's so many variables there but is there any pattern that you see in, in all of this there there are a lot of patterns um i mean a lot of variables but yeah. one pattern that i have seen um for many people who were very, very adamant uh, liver eating carnivores is that that just seems to result in catastrophic failure every time. Um, hmm. And I know that Paul Saladino was a huge advocate for eating organs and was even um, selling like desiccated organs. And um, I think that vitamin A toxicity may have become a real problem for him. As I, I think I mentioned earlier, I think that the carnivore diet may somehow lower the threshold of vitamin A toxicity. And um, I don't know anyone who has successfully stayed on a low carb diet, eating the amount of liver that um, some of the people who were hardcore carnivore advocates and who 
switched and became very against it um, were eating. And so I, I suspect that that might be one of the common problems. I don't think that was true for Danny Roddy. I remember Danny Roddy back on the early forums. Um, he was making his own pemmican. And um, I think he had an experience with scurvy that may or may not have been related to the pemmican. And so I can definitely understand why he would look somewhere else after having an experience like that. But um, I haven't followed up with him to try to see if there was something about the way that he was doing carnivore that made it less successful for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just seems to be such a, I, I, I really, I never fit really well with, uh, getting into a tribe, you know, I don't do well with that in high school. I could never pick which table was going to be my designated table. So I kind of rotated around different groups. You had the country Western group, you had the rap group, you know, you, you don't know which one to go to. You just go to all of them and visit. I like it all. It's fine. So I, I have that tendency on every level of not being able to like get on the raw, raw bandwagon team thing. It doesn't work long for me. I I'm always start so poking holes you. at everything. And I'm always like, no, why? No, I don't like this. This is not, I can't, this doesn't work, you know? So whether it's theologically, politically, every, I just don't fit with that. But uh, I, so that's kind of where I'm at. You know, I, what I'm looking at is a practical roadmap to finding what is the best way to help the masses get the hell off this uh, train flying off of the tracks into the valley of death that is the standard American diet imported across the world. And so that's why that's my detective mission is to figure out what that is and what is the best way to heal from it and long-term thrive on it and financially afford that pathway of success. Right? So all those factors considered, I look at, okay, if Ray's right and what, what if they're both right? What if the carnivore people are right and the Ray people are right in some way or somebody else is right, you know, that what if, you know, there's multiple paths down the mountain, but then that's almost too nebulous because you're still left in the dark. So I want to press further. Well, what, why would they both be wrong? And why yeah. is someone wrong and what someone's right here and there and wrong there? All of this needs to be figured out because again, I keep looking at, you know, from, from the big picture view, practicality, I don't think the American public will ever be able to fully embrace or any public, uh, we'll be able to embrace the carnivore diet as a long-term solution to these uh, maladies. It's just, you know, for a variety of reasons that we've suggested today, the cost yeah. prohibitive, they're trying to make meat so expensive already. Inflation is going to make it worse. Uh, attacks on cattle in Ireland and everywhere else is going to make it worse. Uh, you know, um, so that's a scary choke. I guess what I'm saying is if you, if you know that malevolent forces are trying to make it hard to, eat me and you don't have the resources to afford the local farmer who is going to be expensive to be buy that kind of meat. And then you're going to eat that every day. And then you got to go, people are working class people. They go through drive throughs They go through gas stations. It's hard to eat clean carnivore in those, in those settings. I mean, you can do it, but it gets expensive eating $5 uh, slim gyms, you know, or whatever, you know? And so I, I think about all those variables. And then I look at what Ray Pete's saying is his tools of medicine. It's, milk, orange juice, mushrooms, a carrot a day. Those are pretty cheap. Those are pretty like non-threatening, scary things. A little bit of soup, a little bit of meat here, a little coconut oil. I'm thinking, well, I don't know. I mean, that might be uh, a safer path away from the calamity of all of these diseases for the public and the working class folks to be able to afford, especially because it does incorporate some plant and other things that are not on the establishment hit list to eliminate. <laughs> it make <laughs> extremely unaffordable, right? They're not actively, yeah. we don't hear stories of Klaus Schwab uh, decimating fields of carrots like they want to destroy cattle, right? So I'm looking at all those factors and I'm trying to think, all right, I got to figure this out. So it's, it's going to take conversations like with you and others who are open-minded I'm not caught up in these, like, I've got to be right modes of fight or flight. I'm tired of that. I just want to find out what works and why and what's scalable realistically 
where masses, because I don't want this to be something that only exists in the podcast world. And, you know, to the extent that keto has become mainstream, and I think carnivore is going to increasingly follow behind it, right, as you see, um, that they tend to do it the wrong way, you know, the dumb, the dumb, I call there's dumb keto and there's smart keto, and, they're, you know, because of car corporations making all of these different ripoffs of, you know, sweeteners and muffins that are keto and these terrible things that taste horrible and have all these horrible things in them, I don't know. I don't know the long-term real effect of doing those things, you know, especially because they're going to have a lot of PUFA in them. So what do you think about all of that? I mean, that's kind of where we're landing the plane here. <laughs> well, first of all, cheers to no tribes. Yeah. My gosh, I, I even hate that word. I'm not part yeah. of your tribe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I sometimes get a little flack about that because, I won't cheerlead people who say things that I think are dumb, even if their conclusion from it is that you should eat a carnivore diet. Right, like right, right. I'm not on board with that at all. You're not going to take the, the proximate <laughs> win, right? You want the real win based on truth. That's good. Yeah. And I do think that there are multiple, I mean, I think it's obvious you, you would have to be deliberately wearing a blind or, to not see that there are multiple ways that people can be healthy. So I'm not sure if, like one way of looking at it is try to find the common denominator, but I'm not sure that that is necessarily gonna be fruitful because it might have to do with context. Um, like it might have to do with where you're coming from. Like it might be that for some people, even though a repeat diet might work brilliantly for one person it might not work for another person for some particular reason and so there's no common denominator to be found in there um mm. however the more tools that you have in your toolbox because like your situation's going to change like maybe today everything's working great and maybe tomorrow something will change and what was working for you perfectly is not going to work for you anymore and you have to be able to to say you have to be open enough to say that something else might be more appropriate now yeah. um yeah. even even if it goes against something that you firmly believed was yeah. the reason that's one thing that i that i wanted to say that didn't that i didn't get to is that a lot of people um they get attached to a reason that somebody makes up for why something works right. so a lot of people go on a carnivore diet and it works really well for them. So somebody comes along and says, oh, the carnivore diet works because X. And then people glom onto this because X and they forget that there was not really evidence for that. Yeah. There was only evidence that the thing worked. Right. And so you've got to let go of the um, explanations that might yeah. not be right. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. And, um, you know, I, 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 I want to get to the bottom of this because I think it's going to be increasingly, I mean, when you have reports of children 12 years old getting colon cancer, this is a catastrophe. Mm. It's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Epidemic surges of these numbers. And you think to yourself, man, you know, there's going to be so many charlatans and ideologues and they are, are coming into the gap of the lack of credibility of the establishment nutrition science. And it's yes. so hard for the average person who doesn't have time to devote to the level of research that folks who have programs and shows and whatever are able to do. And to me, the average person needs a very, you know, unfortunately, because of the lack of time they have to attend to this issue, they need a very simple kind of format. The United States government has done that. It's called seed oils and grains. That's your primary <laughs> fuel base, right? Everything yeah. else is kind of, you know, you add to taste, whatever, but it's seed oils and grains, seed oils and grains, seed oils and grains. Everything you go is going to have that. And that's their little foundation stone that they have built the, the human nutritional like framework of the system that they operate on. Every person you go to right now in America who's not particularly keen on any type of dietary guideline is going to be eating seed oil and grain today. That's what you do. That's your foundation. So what will be the foundation core of the, of the off ramp of the, of the um, lifeboats that are going to be rescuing people out of this. And I'm concerned about 
it may be the case that we just never know. It's all up to the individual, but I'm concerned that that will allow the establishment's nice, neat program to continue to win out at the end of the day, right? Because if you do carnivore and it get it gets rid of, uh, uh, you know, your skin rash, but then you you try to eat fruit and it, or or you have a you know cake on a birthday and you're like, wow, I feel even worse than I did on sugar before, and you don't know what's going on. You're in the dark. It's easy to tap out of these pathways out of the system because there's just so many infinite variables and no one knows what's going on. And all of the research is mostly going towards, you know, propaganda reports, not things that are actually valuable to the individual. So I hope yeah. that this is something that, you know, folks in all of these, that's one of the reasons why I bring these people from different, um, you know, camps on because I want them to drill down to what are the foundational mechanisms, you know? I mean, there's obviously more than one way down a mountain perhaps, but why, how does the, how do they, it's not, it's not that every way. Works. Right. That's right. what I want to is that not every way works. And there are, I think, some mechanisms that are kind of rather universal for human physiology at some point, you know, and what those are need to be fleshed out rather than, you know, battling on the internet like, you know, stupidity would have you to do, right? I mean, ultimately, we've got to get things done. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate you too. It's really good to know that there are people like you out there. Um, searching for answers. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time as well. And again, the website, www.mostly-fat.com. Anything else that you'd like us to know about that we should uh, event or anything? I think that's the wrap for today. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. Take care. You too.